briefly, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. And it's very interesting uh, growing up with the Vietnam War, really, and, and realizing that our government lies to us. Well, back in those days, you know, as a, as I was a Navy brat. My father was career military. So that's a pretty big realization. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the world is different than you thought it was. And then at the same time, uh, psychedelics. So I did my share of LSD and much later ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. That was more recent. But, uh, you know, psychedelics, you don't just feel different. The world is different. And you realize, whoa. I see the world in the way that I do because of the way my mind works. And if my mind is different, it's going to be a different world. Big realization. <laughs> a lot of people get stuck there. Give me some more acid. But the reason why Buddhism, etc., exploded in the 70s was because of the psychedelic revolution in the 60s. People realized we needed this other way to pursue this insight, right? Now, I'd been a draft resistor as well, so I dropped out. I was a hippie in Hawaii, and it was there that I eventually became involved in, in Zen practice. And then after that, went back to graduate school because I wanted to sort of look more and more at the history of the uh, Asian traditions, mm -hmm. what they had to say about what I was experiencing. I wanted to sort of use that, and so that was... That was the progression. And then I eventually ended up uh, the Zen master that I'd started to practice with in Hawaii, Rob uh, Yamada Cohen, he visited. Mm -hmm. Then I, uh, I really felt very connected with him. So I ended up living in Japan 20 years and um, um, completing the koan, the curriculum of koan study with him. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and... So I've been very lucky, right? I've been able to combine all this, right? Uh -huh. My commitment to spiritual practice with my intellectual studies mm -hmm. and a little bit of activism, well, more than a little bit of activism and mm -hmm. more than a little bit of psychedelics uh, along the way. You know, they all have been able to kind of work together. But I know that among Buddhist teachers, there's a lot of debate. You know, how useful are psychedelics when yeah. somebody has, you know, considers themselves on the Buddhist path and how useful is it not? And of course, some people, you know, say you're just splattering your mind against the wall and that, you know, other people like, like Jack Kornfield, I know he's like famous for, you know, saying this could be a very useful tool, you know, mm -hmm. in conjunction. So I'm curious, uh, as a child of the sixties and being on that first side of psychedelics, what do you think about the return of psychedelics in Buddhism? I think it's very exciting. Yeah. Um, you're right that it's very controversial in the Buddhist world. There's, there's a fascinating book uh, which debates that based on a tricycle article. What's the book called? Uh, anyway, it's, it, it goes into some detail on, and has arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, the basic problem is uh, I think a lot of the Buddhist traditions are pretty traditional. <laughs> you know, they're kind of fixed in their way. I mean, uh -huh. look, I, I lived in Asia almost 30 years, and there's not any Buddhist, and I was all over, there's no Buddhist tradition there that I would want to import as is. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's valuable stuff there, but it's not just about appropriating what they've done. We've got to be creative. And, uh, you know, very few teachers have any experience of anything like psychedelics. I mean, it may have played a role at one time in Tibetan or something. I don't know, you know, in some of the tantric stuff, but basically they don't really. And, and so I think this is our, this is one of the important new developments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what, when I talk to fellow Buddhist practitioners, including teachers, almost all of them have some psychedelic experience and, mm -hmm. Certainly in my case, I think I was enough of a repressed, stuck up in my head intellectual that without something like that, I think it would have been really hard mm -hmm. to get into Buddhist practice. In fact, even then, I kind of got tricked into it. <laughs> my, my karma was to be tricked into it. And that was the only way it happened. So I think psychedelics... Is, can be a really, really important part of, of the path. But, of course, it's tricky. I also have a friend that I was living with who had a very bad trip. It, mm. 
it plugged into some deep psychological problems. He went home and he shot himself. He killed himself. You know, so we know, we know things can go wrong. So it's no joke. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the legal repercussions as well. But I think more and more there's the realization that this can play an important role. Yeah. I mean, how it's going to play out now in the future, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm living in Colorado. Marijuana is, and also I, I just recently Denver, I think now uh, psilocybin is yeah. legal there, yeah. which is quite attractive, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I think there's now this petition in Washington, right? Washington state. I keep getting these emails. Mm-hmm. They want to put that on the ballot to make psilocybin uh, legal in what so you know there is definitely a movement and i think it's very exciting i have to say i had more trouble with uh ayahuasca mm. it's just so foul <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like my body was saying you're not going to do that to us again you know, <laughs> kind of thing so and what kind you know. of context were you drinking ayahuasca in uh well i i i was in peru okay and it's interesting, talking about karma, mm-hmm. I'd heard a lot about ayahuasca. I wanted to do ayahuasca. I was curious. Mm-hmm. Very, kind of, very different from the psychedelic, right? Yeah, yeah. And more body-based, right? Yeah. So uh, I really wanted to try, but my, my, my attitude is when it's meant to happen, it will fall into place. Mm-hmm. Okay, what happened? I got invited down to Peru mm-hmm. by a group in Lima. Mm-hmm. who wanted me to do a workshop on psychotherapy and Buddhism and lack mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened that the guy that was in charge of me, his mother, along with a French doctor, had founded a ayahuasca center mm-hmm. for the practice of ayahuasca in rural. And so he's done it many times. He, his girlfriend's done it. And it just fell into my lap. They took me to this center. And uh, so I tried it, you know. Mm-hmm. And it, it uh, but it, it was tough. I, I think I was dehydrated, mm-hmm. and it was so foul. It, uh, I guess, both times, it 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 was a, like a very very deep kind of contemplative samadhi, very very deep samadhi of the sort that like. In samadhi, sometimes you see thoughts that you are identifying with that you don't know that you were identifying with. Mm. It was like a very, very deep samadhi in a sashim. Mm. But I, I think lots of other things that people have experienced, and you probably have, I didn't experience them. Mm. And, I'm, and I somehow got the feeling my body was telling me that that wasn't, that wasn't the way forward. Whereas mm. I might be very open to more psilocybin. Mm some other time what about you guys it was very important for you i gather right it was pretty powerful right yeah Yeah. i mean i don't i don't i don't think without that i would have i don't know that the door would have opened with any kind of meditation without knowing what's possible and man with the ayahuasca i was like okay the possibility is that's it that's it wow but Pete was fantastic, but uh, it was it was with, within an Umbandaimi tradition. And that's interesting because it's the Umbanda, which of course is Afro-Brazilian. And so it's got the Orishas, the spirit possession. So, you know, it's a, it's a challenging first, uh, you know, and, and like to see a bunch of people dressed in white, you know, flailing around, uh, you know, yeah. engaging, engaging with spirits. It's like not the easiest first way in. And Pete was just there with the biggest smile rolling around in his vomit in the leaves, just oh, happy gosh. as can be. And yeah. uh, so much so that the, the people who, who run the ceremony, Brazilians who've been doing this for a very long time, um, were super impressed because it's not every day that someone just shows up and just kind of, even though you couldn't walk very well, I mean, you just kind of, you opened up into it. Wow. It was uh, such beauty. Oh, man. I, I, I had... That first experience was just beauty, pure beauty. Yeah. But I've also had where the it going down and right away I knew it was going to be tough. It was going to be really hard. (laughs) So it hasn't always just been pure beauty, that's for sure. And I think I was lucky that that first one was just such a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Because if it had been, I did kind of a, more of a Peruvian style one. And I think if it had been like that, I said, mm, 
that was, you know, really interesting, but it didn't open the door in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, then that is interesting because it's so embodied, you know, that uh, mm-hmm. unlike the shamanic or even the Santo Daimi traditions, you're like running around, jumping around and mm-hmm. different. For me, that was very important. That the, the Peruvian thing when I just had to sit there, I literally was contracting every muscle in my body just sitting there. It was very difficult, which and I appreciate difficult situations. So it gave me what I needed. <laughs> but that ability to move, and that really uh, that might have made a difference me for me. Yeah, yeah. In both both my cases, it was just sitting there. So, oh, yeah. and, you know, that that's different. Well, yeah, it's not my place to invite you to someone else's deal, but I really <laughs> think that the umbandaime being able to move. Oh, I mean, we oh. talked about you talked about you know being open to love. The ayahuasca showed me how open I could be to just re- receiving love. And be, when I received it in that manner, I also was able to to give it out in ways that I'd never thought possible. I mean, I was a I was radiating love out oh, and wow. absorbing it in, and it was oh my gosh, yeah. But, but to, to answer your question, David, that uh, for me, I think the most powerful experience was when I first started drinking. It was not that long after this car accident I was telling you about. And I knew I had a lot of unresolved just you know, energies and just things which were still causing me a lot of physical and emotional grief. And so I, the first time, you know, it was a very powerful experience, but didn't even touch that. It took me six months to come back. Second time, also a very powerful experience. And it wasn't until the fifth time. And the fifth time, I was sitting there and I felt energy in my hara. And then came up my spine and went right to where the break was, which is now a big piece of metal all fused together. And a whole bunch of things happened at the same time. It was, but what, what, it, what I think that the thing of it was like something just opened up and energetically that, that part of me that was there, even though I was unconscious when I was in this car accident and I was always happy that like I wasn't conscious, but the part of me that was, you know, the eye that never sleeps, that was exactly there had been holding on to that moment of breaking for 13 years and it let it go. And it, I just felt like I was hit by lightning. And so I, you know, I spent two hours there just with this release and everything just turning into this, you know, array of whatever, but uh, you know, it, 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 I, I didn't leave healed, but what I did leave was whew, like something let go and I felt I had my life back. So that, that, wow. I think that's why it was powerful for me. With Umba and Daimi, and I'd, I'd be curious of your thoughts if, if you've had any clarifications on this, that there is this whole other aspect. You know, energy, I could take that since birth intellectually and uh, channels and chakras. Yeah. But uh, bodhisattvas, different beings who come into your body, engaging with different beings and nature spirits, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother leap. And it, so kind of like Pete was saying, like, I could never have made a leap like that without being pushed off the cliff. But I'm curious, as a, as a Buddhist practitioner, you know, where do those sorts of forces, beings, you know, and whether it's Odishas in the biggest sense or, you know. Sp- oh. I, I've had experiences where I, I, I felt I was communicating with, you know, invisible, disincarnate beings that were teaching me something. Mm-hmm. Where does that fit into Buddhism? Well, yeah. I, I don't know. We could maybe talk to them to some but you know, it's like that's not. It's not usually a part of Buddhism. So, you know, it, it doesn't add up. Uh. Wonderful. <laughs> it doesn't add up. I love it. Uh. Don't know mind. You know, fantastic. Fantastic. And Sorry. It was last word and. Fant- it's fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Uh, oh, don't know mind. Uh, I, know? I thought you said instead of fantastic. I think you said and custard. It's like all right. <laughs> Don't know mine and custard. I'm there. <laughs> I, I prefer ice cream, but anyway, um, right. yeah. So I mean, the world is. Yeah, I mean, one of the takeaways for me from Buddhism is, you know, I don't. Oh, you guys just froze. Are you still there? We're hearing you, but this might be a good time okay. to kind of uh, wrap us up so we don't uh, kick you off again. And we're done. 